Hello. Welcome to the Bat Ass Podcast, the Batman the Animated Series Show podcast, where we talk about Batman the Animated Series, or in this case, Batman Beyond. My name is Clay McCormick, and with me is Sean Murphy. How you doing, Sean? Good, man. I had a couple crazy weeks traveling Europe. Uh, I got a pretty decent uh, Evan Eastman story that I'll ah, save for the second half of this. But, excellent. Uh, I figured uh, we could talk about that for the second half. Excellent. You know, it's funny. Um, uh, as far as branding goes with these podcasts, I feel like I screwed up. Well, it wasn't up to me, but we were recording uh, an episode of our Voyager podcast the other night, and we had to cut it short because a bat flew through Wes's window <laughs> and started flying around in his room while he was recording. So uh, I told mm-hmm. him not to cut any of it out because people are going to want to hear his uh, girlish yeah. screams as he tries to avoid the bat that's flying around his head. <laughs> Have you ever had a bat in your house? I've no. I had a bird once, twice actually. Yeah. We have uh, we have these pocket doors, and um, I we think a bird. There must be have been like a hole up by the the roof somewhere, and a bird mm-hmm. came in and must have kind of fallen down into the pocket doors, the like the the interior of the pocket doors, and it was it what? freaked the hell out of us because we didn't know what the hell was going on, and we, then we would just hear these like scratching and like wing noises against our wall and our friggin right. friggin guard dog uh laying down on the floor with his face right against the hole where the door goes uh didn't move a muscle and so we ended up having to open the windows and then open the pocket doors and we didn't know what it was at first and then so we opened the pocket doors and this little kind of dark face popped out we couldn't make out what the hell it was and then popped back in and then all of a sudden, this bird just came flying out and kind of went around the room once and then went out through the window. Mm. Have yeah, you man, ever had a bat? That's nuts. Yeah. Um, and they fly so weird. Like, it's just creepy. Yeah. It's like, you, you know, when you see a snake, you know what snakes are, you know what they look like. But even when you see one, the I'm aware move, of the concept like, of snakes. Yes. Well, you've seen snakes, right? <laughs> but the way bats fly, it's just so unnatural yeah. uh, and erratic. And even, it's just, you can't wrap your head around it. And they're black, and you don't know what you're looking at, and just flap it. Yeah, I had to take a tennis racket and swat one to death just to oh, get it out geez. of a bedroom once. Yeah. Luckily, it was mostly alive when I threw it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're not so that, fully at fault for the death of that bat. No. Okay. Keep your mostly. conscience clean there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he Wes sent me. He sent me a video of it, and it was it. It wasn't flying. It had gone down onto the carpet and was just like crawling around on the carpet with its weird elongated yeah. bat arms it was creepy yeah it's even worse but he's fine now yeah well, that's good anyway <laughs> uh we're talking about two episodes of batman beyond from season two of batman beyond we are almost done ish i think we've got one two three four episodes of our show left we'll be done with season two but uh, it's been a long season, man. We we keep getting distracted. I feel like a lot of things, a yeah. lot of curveballs have hit us the past year, and uh, this this season's been harder to record. Yeah, yeah, lots of uh, lots of scheduling things, and we've been kind of moving around a lot separately and whatnot. So, but yeah. <clears throat> we'll get there. But we're today we're talking about Armory and Sneak Peek. So we'll take a quick break, and we'll come back with Armory. All right, Armory, directed by Kyung Won Lim, written by John P. McCann. And in this one, after losing his job as a weapons designer, the stepfather of one of Terry's friends turns to crime to make ends meet as a supervillain called Armory. Uh, That might be the shortest write-up that I've read on this show, for this show, and it is pretty comprehensive of what the plot of this episode is. This episode's about... It's about yeah. three three action sequences with maybe like two scenes of characters, short character scenes, and then it's that's kind of it. Do you think how many people collectively wrote all of these summaries of the episodes? Do you think it's one guy who just did it all and everyone knew to back off, or do you think there's people constantly fighting and editing and re? re you know what I mean, tweaking people's descriptions. Yeah, I always wonder that because. It, I always feel like it's the more obscure ones that end up having the most people fighting over them, if I had to guess, because they're the 
the people that are the hardcore fans of the really obscure stuff are going to get into fights. Yeah. I feel like this <laughs> is probably somewhere in the middle where most people don't care. <laughs> There's got to be like a network of nerds who they've never met, but they know each other. And they're like, oh, my God, like, you get an update when someone updates the Wikipedia or whatever. And you get this like your phone alert, like, oh, my God, Stuart rewrote what I wrote. I wrote it perfectly. He knows how I like to describe Mr. Freeze. He keeps coming in and changing my shit. You know, it's like 2 a.m. and he can't get to sleep because he's worried that Stuart's going to change his shit again. And, you know, well, to be it's fair, be something like that. To be fair, Stuart's adverb usage is questionable at best. OK, so maybe it's, it's true. Yeah, he doesn't. He, he's barely a Batman fan, too. He's sort of <laughs> tourist. So, yeah. What did you think of Armory? I liked it. I uh, I'm a, kind of a sucker for stories that involve special ops people trying to assimilate back into culture. Mm -hmm. The fact that this guy was like an ex Navy SEAL or whatever, and he was working for a weapons manufacturer and had to use his old skill to, you know, to, to plot forward. I'm just kind of a sucker for people who are ex military, who have trouble assimilating and have to like use their old abilities sure. in situations in a civilian environment. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? I, I thought it was okay. Um, I, I I found my well. First of all, based on the thumbnail, I thought that this character was the Batman Beyond version of Lockup, because mm -hmm. he has kind of a similar look to Lockup, the uh, the the pr yeah. prison based antagonist, antihero. Um, yeah. And once they got into it, they kept calling him Armory, in mm -hmm. a way that made, and he just shows up dressed as you know fresh from the brand manager apparently. And I thought that he was a pre-existing villain, but this seems yeah. to be his first appearance. But the way that they were talking about him made it sound like he was a guy who was back on the scene. And so I was a little mm -hmm. bit confused by that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you're right. He does seem like Lockup. It does seem like there's a lot of elements from uh, TAS in this, this episode. But yeah, it was um, just... Uh, it was it was a little strange the way it felt like there was a lot of other story stuff on the cutting room floor for this one maybe because it right. it is kind of just three big action sequences and the mm -hmm. stuff but the stuff that they did with the characters I thought had potential yeah just didn't have a lot yeah, of time absolutely. to do it I was were you thrown off by his uh, mullet the beginning yeah. at all <laughs> well <laughs> i don't know why that haircut <laughs> should we should we just jump to what we'd like to draw because i want to draw that haircut it's like a jerry curl what's the when black people have a mo it's like what bishop had where it's short uh kind of it, it it seemed like it was like a uh an arsenio hall haircut that yeah, faded back you. into a mullet which is quite a choice i'm glad you jumped in because i was afraid of accidentally saying something racist <laughs> Which is why I'm sure you probably jumped in. Yeah, it was uh, interesting. Interesting choice for uh, yeah. for the hair. I feel like he looked like a jacked Billy D. Williams. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He. Yeah. he <laughs> I yeah. I thought he was. I thought he was an interesting character, but there just seemed to be so much more they could have done with him. Um, yeah. Because I, like, they have this family stuff on the table. That's interesting because he's this he's a stepfather who's trying to provide for this new family <clears throat> and they get into that a little bit, um, yeah. but they don't really get in too much about the, you know, the, 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 the stress of losing his job and that kind of yeah. thing. And, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe they didn't really need to get into more of it, but it felt the, the yeah. action sequences are so long that it felt like. Yeah there was something they could have trimmed them and done a little bit more character stuff. I don't know, but this show tends yeah. to air on the side of action sequences anyway. So who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I thought the animation was actually really good. Um, yeah. Look great. I like the action sequences and stuff. And I, I, I kind of like the guy's outfit, but there's some changes I'd want to make. Like he had just a sock, ring. pretty bland looking black mask. Really. Mm -hmm. um, there are elements that I really liked. But yeah, underneath, I just could not stop thinking, this guy looks cool, but he has a mullet underneath. <laughs> I don't know why that threw me off so much. <laughs> hey, there's no reason you can't look cool and have a mullet, right? <laughs> That's true. Have you seen the new haircut that 
people seem to be going for. This is old man corner here. Uh, oh boy. Yep. It's like it's a mullet, but the sides are completely shaved. So it's like no uh-huh. no sideburns sh- uh, shaved up to a- above the ears. And so it just looks mm-hmm. like there's a there's a, there's a there's like a maxi pad of hair on top of your head. It's like a really wide uh, mohawk. It's basically. like it's like in The Simpsons when Mr. Burns tells Don Mattingly to shave his sideburns, and he just shaves all the way up the side of his head. It's kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, it's funny how I was watching this thing on YouTube. You can find these videos a lot, but like, how many things The Simpsons got right after 35 years of TV? Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty interesting. Luckily, that well, I guess no. I guess that that, that now has come to fruition. The weird sideburn looks. Yeah, yeah. All comes I've back seen, around to the Simpsons. My my lesbian friends seem to favor that look, shaving one side of their head, uh, while the other hair is kind of the rest of the hair is like washed oh, sure. over. I don't know. If all the lesbians got together and decided this was a look. Yeah, they 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 <laughs> you, have a. You might want to yearly, step in, Clay, before I say something stupid. <laughs> they have they have a yearly conference, and we probably don't need to go into it more than that. Um, no, no, no. Let me let me explain what probably happens there, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh the other the other interesting thing about this th- these two episodes actually this one being the first one is it's the first mention of powers in a while they, yeah, they make, his son. yeah they mention him offhand in this one and a bit more in the next one but yeah we haven't seen anything from him since i think the first hmm. episode of the season or possibly the finale of season one even the episode itself the, in the news reel they're talking about and you know i forget his name wayne pa- his powers his son who we haven't heard from for a while it's like <laughs> right yes. kind of meta <laughs> <laughs> paxton is that his name yeah paxton, paxton. there you go paxton powers Ugh. who has his who inherited his dad's uh, intense angry eyebrows apparently Derek powers was a big fan of i don't know aliens or something <laughs> mm-hmm. name his son after bill paxton <laughs> <clears throat> I have a dog yeah. named Pliskin. Derek Powers has a son named Paxton. <laughs> um, what did you think? Uh, were you really jealous of Terry keeping his bat suit inside the uh, the the secret compartment on his motorcycle? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. It's hard not to like that. Um, I keep forgetting that it's a cloth suit. I think of it as a uh, peck suit where it's like nanobots you mm. push a button and the suit just sort of like iron man unfolds its way onto your body right you know, but whenever he pulls the sock uh, towel back i'm like oh yeah i guess you know i guess it could still be nanotechnology but i've been looking at so much batman beyond stuff and there's so much concept art out there and the arkham games and whatnot oh yeah the batman beyond suit has been reinterpreted to be like robocop suit basically with black bat ears on it well you um, know it's it's funny about the Batman suit in general, I've always found that since I, ever since I was a kid, I think there mm-hmm. is a certain amount of um, imagination that your your brain can put onto whatever it is that he's wearing, right? Because if yeah. you're watching, if you if you look at a shot of Batman, mm-hmm. he's just muscles with a gray and blue, but in oh. your brain, you're kind of subconsciously doing some math about what it might be. Does he have body mm-hmm. armor on? And then I, whenever I, when I was a kid, whenever they would do a shot where you would see his, him like pulling on his shirt like it was just a sweater or something, yeah, it always yeah. threw me off because I always felt like it's got to be more than just like a, a Hanes sweatshirt with a, a bat logo on it, right? Yeah, yeah. I still, you know, every time I watch it too, like my one regret, my, one of my few regrets when I did. My Batman Beyond is I never really figured out the fucking wings, the glider wings. Mm. Um, I still think that they don't, they look good if he's in a couple different positions with his arms stretched out. Right. But I don't know, man. I just don't think there's any good way to make them work unless, I mean, the way Dan Mora drew them here and there looks really good, but I just never found a way to really implement them convincingly you know I yeah know it's like a huge part of his design it's a tough it's a tough thing to to do at an angle other than up you know straight yeah. on straight on with his arms up or out i think yeah. that, that's why so many of the uh uh promo shots are are like that right you can get a bit of yeah. when he's sort of in like a hunched over kind of thing they can create yeah. sort of a, a bit of a canopy kind of effect that is kind of cool but yeah they are a little awkward 
Yeah, and they, they just they they are whatever you need them to be. So if you if he needs to lower his hands to grab someone, and um, the wings can still stay out. They're not like attached to his wrists or anything. Right. Um, like I tried to do the thing where his spikes on his arms extend, and it's like this like fly this these wings that pop out but then if he moves his arms so do the, so do the the wings and i had a few panels where i thought i drew it really cool and unique in a way i haven't seen them done before but still overall i just i'm not happy with how i treated them and i i don't know i wish i hadn't used them at all sometimes you know yeah well <laughs> yeah you have to though it's that's a bit such a big part that those red wings are like are r2 batman yeah. beyond what the what the thigh pouch is to, to Azrael Batman, you know, you just don't have even to get have me started it. on that bullshit. If you didn't Your have it, you, if you didn't have it, you would hear from it from the fans. Is what I'm saying. So it's a good thing you put it in. It's it's funny. Uh, one of the things teaching my wife how to write comics, um, I told her whenever you create a new character, you should give that character pouches or a backpack or pockets <laughs> or something because you don't know if this character is going to need to like pull something out, like pull out a gun or mm-hmm. put something away. Um, it's silly, but uh, every character design, I think, that works well it has some kind of pouch mechanic where they can put something away if they need to. Because uh, you don't even know what they're going to be doing in the plot, but eventually you're going to need them to have a pocket somewhere that can hold yes. something the size of a gun, maybe a little bit bigger, you know? Yeah, it's the magic of the utility belt, right? <clears throat> exactly. It's my, my favorite thing about uh, the Batman 89 utility belt, where if you, the, the point of, in it's baked into the name. A utility yeah. belt should be have things in it that are useful mm-hmm. to you, but on that suit, yeah. it's just that yellow belt with those little cylinders on it. How useful could any of that shit be? But whenever he needs something, he just reaches behind him underneath his cape and pulls out yeah. whatever it is he needs. No problem. Yeah, the big secret pocket in the back that nobody can see. Yeah, it's so it's so different, isn't it, from the. 70s style utility belt that the Keaton Batman has to the Pattinson mm. Batman that has like a gigantic thigh pouch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On top of all the other it? shit on his like police belt. Yeah. I like the police belt look. I like a chunky belt that sticks out and it's yeah. sort of like a weightlifter belt with pouches on it. Um, I think that makes the most sense. And uh, it's funny because remember, uh, where was I? Barnes and Noble, they have all those like cheap books at the beginning when you walk into the store. Mm-hmm. And at one point they were selling like a book about Batman, which was this like explanation of all of his his gear, the suits, like behind the scenes in Gotham, and it was like airbrushed and painted really nice. Um and they explained like his cowl and they they basically hired concept artists to like explain what's in the ears. Oh sure, yeah. And they were Oh, the ears are antennas. This is how he's able to, you know, they made everything utilitarian, which makes sense, but I hated it because it just took away the magic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. They just, um, they do those books for the Star Wars universe that are really cool. Th- those yeah. are fun because there's so many technical things yeah. in Star Wars and Star Trek where it's like, yeah. what does the inside of a Y wing look like, you know? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, for something like Batman, it's, you just kind of have to, assume yeah. there, there's there's some magic built into it that he has what he yeah. needs it's the the 66 batman thing where when he needs shark repellent bat spray he has it it just reminded me a, a friend in high school got really into the tech of star wars and he bought one of those books and he was like oh. In the cafeteria once, and I was just trying to eat my pizza and get back to class. And he just gave me this whole diatribe of how lightsabers are made and why you need to have a wooden handle because the only thing to insulate from these crystals is a piece of wood. And how great was it that you needed such a low low tech piece of hardware inside of a high tech sword? I don't know. He went on and on about it. Interesting to him, the the wooden. I think. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy to be corrected because I really don't give a shit. But I think there's actually wood inside of a lightsaber to to buffer against the sure the i'm in crystal it. that charges it or something yeah the kyber crystal the you, gotta, you gotta have something you to go. insulate the kyber crystal otherwise it'll blow up in your hand <clears throat> what's what is it what's the the dilithium crystals of star trek right dilithium is star trek yep okay so and then what is it don't act Wars? like you don't know <laughs> uh kyber i think it's kyber crystals are the things inside kyber, the, okay inside the lightsabers yeah <clears throat> yeah well Sure, whatever works. Yeah. Well, that was always my favorite detail about the Jedi is that the final step of becoming a Jedi is you have to build your own lightsaber. Awesome. That is cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But imagine when you're like, you're whittling a piece of wood and you're like, 
this is going into a lightsaber? Like, trust me, Luke. Just keep whittling. <laughs> it's part of the lightsaber. I'm, Shut the fuck I was up. always amazed Luke did so well, considering that everyone who could show him how to do it was dead. That's true. Kind of a dying art. Yeah, he did a good job. I love the green lightsabers. Good stuff. And it's it's nice that you have to make your own, but really, it's easier just to steal one. Yeah, that's why that's why it always bothered me in Attack of the Clones when they show up uh-huh. at the end and there's like they just start like throwing lightsabers at people who don't have them for that final fight. It's just like there's too many. It's too many. Yeah, the lightsaber. Yeah. The and lightsaber. Then you introduce is... the idea of a purple lightsaber because that's what Samuel Jackson wanted. Uh, so yeah, like, colors okay, is fine. fine. You have, I don't care about the colors. It's just. It's better, you know. Lightsabers are 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 better in small uh, small bits, you know. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> thank you for joining us on the Star Wars podcast. Yeah. When do we get to complain about uh, Mandalorian? Oh, this isn't no. that podcast. No, we stopped covering that <laughs> um, a while ago. So you were covering never. Mandalorian. We did the first season. Yeah. Yeah, we and we came away and we we're like, yeah, that was fine. And then Wes was like, I don't know if we need to cover any more of that. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's fair. There was a lot of podcasts that stopped covering Picard after season two and a mm-hmm. half. They're like, I can't, I can't do this anymore, and they begrudgingly had to go back and enjoy season three of Picard, which was a lot better. Yeah, we almost didn't do it honestly because season two was so bad. Yeah, but uh, I'm glad. Yeah, we a did. lot of people felt that way. <clears throat> I'm glad we did, but yeah. you know. Ultimately, I, I give it a, a B or so. But yeah. Head over to patreon.com slash the Penske file if you'd like to hear our coverage of season three of Star Trek Picard. It's so, I know this isn't Batman, I'm sorry, but it's so crazy that Picard is one of like the standout characters in entire fiction for a generation of people. Uh, if you told me there's going to be Jean-Luc Picard in a shitty series i'd be like i don't care i'm always gonna watch john luke picard like i love him that much yeah and you managed to just rip that up in two seasons to make us not give a shit mm. it's amazing how much you made us stop caring you know even the yeah. fact that john patrick stewart's so old and this might be the last chance even i was i have not seen season two because it was just so bad i felt so rejected and yeah. angry and annoyed and resigned like i don't know man I, to go into a further topic here when they were redoing all of these old properties, they just managed to fuck up most of them. Like they try to do Lord of the Rings, they try to do more Terminator, they try to do whatever. They just keep making it worse. Except for the card season three, they managed to like salvage most of it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I would just defy you. Like name one classic property that's been re- redone that they've actually managed to be on par with the rest. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm talking Indiana Jones, Star Wars, like. I know there's a lot of nerd rage about when they try to redo these movies or do continuations long, long after the math, the, the magic is gone. Yeah. Um, like that's been the thing that people basically complaining about since the nineties, since the prequels, you know? Right. Yeah. So this is nothing new, but it's just nuts to me that they're like, you know, these old IPs that were hot in the eighties, let's do sequels now when all the characters are older and then we'll make everybody happy. Mm-hmm. And they managed to just ruin like a half a dozen of them in the past 20 years. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, you end up in this space, right? This weird, awkward space where if you uh, take these characters that have turned into legends in the minds of the fans and try to do something too new with them, it's going to get rejected. Mm -hmm. And if you try to do something that's too familiar, it's going to get rejected. So you end up in this weird middle space where you're just kind of like running in circles a bit. Um, yeah, you know, I there's uh, you could argue that that's what they did with the new Star Wars. I, I don't know. I, I, I it's yeah. it's tough because the 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 one Star Wars movie where they tried to take some steps forward and do some different stuff is the most div- divisive of all of them. So, yeah, who knows? Yeah, uh, it's almost like I, I, maybe we should take a break and, and make some new things for for a while. Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, I think superhero fatigue is a real thing that's happening. I'm even exhausted by superhero movies. Um, And I work in this industry. (laughs) Um, This could be a whole other podcast, by the way, because I have very complicated thoughts on this. Hmm. Um, It's 
probably not good to just dump it on you right now. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll do a, a special superhero fatigue podcast. You know what we can do? Let's watch the new Flash movie and then oh, talk yes. about Michael Keaton here because yes. that'll Let's be a perfect that. springboard. Yeah. Yeah. And that comes out because I know we we're both sort of hesitant. I'm a little bit more excited than you, but I'm completely uh man uh, admitting that it's going to be hot. Tr- I hope the movie fails, but I want Michael Keaton to do really well. I'm I'm compartment compartmentalizing the shit out of that. Every time I see a new picture or a new clip, I'm just like, okay, <laughs> it's Michael Keaton as Batman, but this is not my Michael Keaton Batman. I need to let it go and try to enjoy this for what it is. Right. Like as soon as yeah, as soon as I saw the first shot of him in action, but it's like a CGI action scene, I was like, oh, I don't want to see this. Half of the fun mm-hmm. is the fact that he can't turn his damn head. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that comes out um the weekend A that we will both be at Awesome Con. And B is also my birthday, so we'll have uh, nice. uh, plenty of reasons to talk about it. Nice, but yeah, let's definitely Good. do an episode about that after we see it. Yeah, and then we can use it just to complain about the state of movies and superhero fatigue and all this stuff. I sure. think that's a good place for it. Um, the one other thing I did notice in this episode that I, I stood out to me only because I feel like he never does this is that Terry actually averted disaster a bit in this one when he uh, dumps the giant mm. sand truck onto the yeah. wall of fire. I feel like most of the time Terry's a little bit more reckless and just yeah. sort of blows stuff up and flies away. It's funny. That's the thing that I would want to draw, actually, is Terry driving construction equipment with sand uh, <laughs> and dumping it. So I thought that that big rig looked pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I thought it looked fine, but I think it could be better, so I'd want to redraw it. Um, but also realized I've drawn sand before, like deserts and things like that. I've never drawn sand being tossed, so I don't know how I would handle that. Yeah. Other than just doing a bunch of stippling for like three hours. Is there, is there a, a an anime s- subsection of animators you could talk to about that? Maybe work, oh, no. working in the <laughs> same basement studio as some other guys you might want to talk to? Yeah, like the, uh, the the semen animators. Yes, yes, that's what I was talking about, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> I'll say it. I don't care. <laughs> I've stepped over a few laser beams in the last half hour. I'm ready to step on one. <laughs> semen animators. Just call them what they are. Uh, it's not water. It's respect. They they need they deserve the respect, right? It's funny because I think we have enough uh, new listeners now who have no idea what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. That'll be fun when they go back and listen to the beginning, get to that episode. I wish I knew what episode that was so I could refer people to it because it was just a rant for 10 minutes right at the beginning. Yes. Um, I don't remember. it comes up enough. I'm sure there's someone out there that does know. And if you do know, please let us know because I'm too lazy to sure. go back and try to find it. I'm going to guess it's season two of the animated series. You know, we're getting in our groove. Well, it we're was, feeling confident. I Sean's going to start throwing curveballs. I think it was the first. It, it must have been the first Clayface episode, right? Hmm, yeah, maybe. So, so that must have been season one. Anyway. What else would spark me to talk about drawing liquid flying across the room? I don't other know. Other than a clay face what, episode. What day is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, yeah, I, so overall, this one, I, I thought it was okay. I thought it was it was fine. Uh, what, would I, what would I draw from this? I don't know. That mullet was pretty rad. Yeah. I liked, I liked the look of Armory... He's tough because it's tough to to go too much of a redesign there because he's you don't want to add too much shit on top of him to make him look ridiculous, yeah. you know. Because I feel like Armory lends itself to okay, he's got forty five guns, <laughs> but you don't need yeah. to do that. Um, yeah, I you know I kind of mm-hmm. like that final sequence when when he when they they uh, he kind of comes clean and and takes out the guy who's probably going to kill his family. That that had some pretty fun mm. stuff in it. I might do something like that. Yeah. What would you rate this one? Uh, another 3. Yeah, I would agree. They're they're all yeah, fu- they're fine. To... Yeah, they're not yep. blowing me away, but yep. not terrible. I've been watching um a lot of X-Men the animated series oh boy. recently. Uh and you know th- that F- that series and Batman are like the two biggest ones from the '90s that mm. people seem to refer to the most. And um, 
my my wife is watching it too and she's like man x-men is just not as good as batman no and she's right um it's funny i mean there's very few times in an animated batman episode where i'll cringe bad dialogue or something seeing it just doesn't look right there's a lot of cringing that i'm doing watching x-men and i i like it but it's it does not hold up as well as batman does yeah the pacing doesn't hold up the the forced comic book animation style is kind of clunky um talk about a hard series to draw i mean there's one shot where they drew a guy walking towards the camera and he's changing from wolverine into maverick Oh, into God. Deadpool, yeah. into Mister Sinister, and like those are three very complicated outfits. Uh, you're talking like spotted blacks and feathering while the character. Like, yeah, that's a lot to animate. Yeah, I mean, think about the difference between the two shows. Batman the animated series. They were like, okay, we're going to take these designs yeah. and make them as simple as possible, and s- right. to animate it graphically, make yeah. them stand out. In X Men, they were like, let's do these comic book accurate. In the era of yeah. comics when artwork was at its most complex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you took a screenshot of X-Men, it looks impressive. Yes. But when you see it move, it's very clunky. Yeah. the From what I remember, it's been a while since I've watched it. But I, I remember that yeah. the animation, the pendulum swings very far in each direction. Yeah. Where yeah. Th- it has some really good looking stuff, but it has some really, really bad looking stuff. Yeah. It's mostly bad. Yeah. I went on to look at uh, X Men, uh, the one that came out in two thousand two, Evolution. Oh yeah, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, I've heard that and one's pretty they good. Were, it the animation's way better. They're yeah. doing more of what Man the Animated Series did. They don't try to do spotted blacks. Uh, the motion's a lot better. It's way easier to look at. Like, I'm sure it looks very two thousands, but. It, it definitely holds up better than the 90s one. Is that the one where Wolverine is like the head of the team and it's like younger kids? Yeah, he's older. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've heard that one's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I really like the costume they gave him, kind of this orange. Yeah. Uh, very close to the brown one from the 90s or the 80s, whatever mm-hmm. that was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's a struggle to get through. But, I mean, what is impressive about X-Men is how they managed to do these complicated multi-episode storylines like the red phoenix right yeah Yeah, um, they're pulling right from the books in a way that that batman never really did yeah which is you know it's kind of interesting though right because batman the animated series is kind of lauded for taking these characters and sort of giving them a bit of a, a a boost and retelling and redefining them a bit you know you've got your mr freeze and stuff and your yeah. two faces and your whatnot <clears throat> but x-men i feel like wouldn't have gotten the same amount of praise if they tried to do that i think maybe maybe mm. because x-men is marvel comics have always been so steeped in continuity that if mm-hmm. you're gonna do the dark phoenix story you may you're gonna you gotta do the dark phoenix story for the most part i know they kind of simplify it a bit but it's not like they completely revamp it to change the way that she becomes phoenix completely or make storm phoenix or you know i mean there's they're 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 skewing pretty close to what the comics did yeah yeah and i think that's why it's that's what's impressive about it is they were able to condense these kind of complicated chris claremont storylines and pay homage to them pretty well yeah um but you could argue that it might have been better if they rewrote some of it and stripped it down to its essence and made it more digestible. Yeah. And they also had these, I mean, you have to watch all the episodes in order. Each episode starts with, um, previously on X recap. Yeah. And it's a lot of stuff going on. You have a ton of characters to follow and, um, yeah, I mean, it's to their credit that they did it, but I remember as a kid watching them and if I wa- if I missed an episode, I'd be like, Oh God, I, I because you don't have DVDs back then. There's right. no internet. You can't down. You know, there's no way to check on what the hell happened. So if you missed an episode, you were kind of fucked. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you come back after two weeks, and you're like, "Why are they in the jungle?" Yeah. What's the Savage Land? Man, why is I, Professor X? Why do his legs work? I always hated this. I never liked the Savage Land in the comics or the the, the TV show. I don't know why. I just never liked it. I didn't know what it was until earlier today when I, all right, so it's this jungle in the middle of Antarctica <laughs> where there are bangs and beasts and where Professor 
X's legs work. Yeah, I think it's the their powers don't work there, right? Is that the deal? Okay. I think so. Yeah, because like, Magneto wasn't able to, to do anything, but yeah, cause, Professor X was fixed. So his I guess his powers are stopping his legs from working. Yeah, maybe. It happens to the best of us. Because I remember, if I, if I remember correctly, I don't know if they do it in the show, but I think in the comics the big deal is that Rogue goes to the Savage Land and she can touch people and it does not kill them. Oh, so she that's where she goes there. to Bang Gambit. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I, well, I don't know. I remember, I remember there being a, a series of Savage Land issues where she was kind of, looked like she was kind of hanging out with Magneto. So I don't uh, know. Who knows? Who's to oh say? Boy. I have to go back and <laughs> dig out my back issues. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> back to Batman. Uh, we're gonna, I think that's going to do it for Armory. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back with a sneak peek. Okay, Sneak Peek, directed by Dan Reba, story by Alan Burnett, teleplay by Stan Berkowitz. In this one, a gossip reporter acquires the technology to become inc incorporeal and becomes the ultimate peeping Tom. When he discovers Batman's identity, he threatens to reveal it on national television, but soon discovers the technology is having an adverse effect on his body. Do you think that Michael McKeon saw the episode with Tim Curry? And he was like, wait, Tim Curry gets to do a weird accent? I want to do a weird accent. And so that's why he was like, I'm going to be an Australian TMZ guy. <laughs> Is that what that was? I couldn't quite place uh, what he was trying to do. but I think it was Australian, yeah. Yeah. And was it supposed to be like hard copy, that show from the 90s? Yeah, it's, you know, the, the 90s were, were a... Uh, there were so many of those types of shows that I think it's yeah. just an amalgam of, of all of them. Yeah, uh, yeah, Ben. I really dug this one. I, yeah. I loved it at the end. He was basically just falling to the center of the earth forever, and that was it. Batman's like, "Well, that's what you get." Yeah, yeah. I, this one, this one didn't grab me until until the the part where he sneaks into the Batcave. Yeah, because I was like, "Okay, sure, he's fades can phase through stuff. That's bad." But then once they did the uh, exposing batman thing yeah. that got my attention and then as he started then the ending man i thought that ending was terrifying yeah yeah I mean, when terry's trying to save him as he's falling through the floor i felt like um this one reminded me a lot of uh, tas the one called uh see no evil and it's oh, sure. this one that i refer to a lot this you basically have a guy who's using a stolen technology or a stolen suit, mm -hmm. and the suit eventually becomes part of his body, or he becomes addicted to it, or something goes on. And the uh, the investigation is, you know, who created this thing, and you find out the guy who created it died or isn't around anymore, and someone else took it, and they're using it now. Um, I thought that was really, I mean, very similar. But I, uh, yeah, I agree. The beginning of this was like, eh, this is fine. This is another three, and then when you uh, risk uh exposing batman uh that's huge and then terry comes out to his family and they just laugh at him right uh and then at the end when this guy's just falling to the center of the earth it just it got real good really quick yeah yeah it had there was the hilarious moment where the uh the, the tong gangster guy busts into the room with the rocket launcher <laughs> <laughs> start yeah. firing rockets it was good it was a good one I, uh, <clears throat> they got into more interesting stuff here than i feel like they have in the past few definitely yeah i i mean, wish that they had dialed it up even more actually yeah um uh, i'm sure there's a like i don't know what i would do to rewrite it but i definitely would love to try to raise the stakes throughout because it just seems like a lot of these episodes are inconsequential to batman and this one really strikes deep right yeah and um the last episode was one of, I think, five episodes that Bruce isn't actually in. And right. I, I didn't think they really needed him because it was, it, it seemed like a much more of a, of a Terry story. But this yeah. one, they finally get into some of the stuff involving Bruce obviously being Batman before. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I was kind of surprised that, I what I really liked about it is that they treated the Michael McKeon character whose name escapes me, uh, 
they treated him they they made him smart as far as uh, a blackmailer goes because instead of just yeah. publishing everything he's like no I'm going to play the game I'm going to build suspense and I'm also trying to going to try to get something out of you guys here so he blurs the faces and stuff I thought that was pretty clever yeah yeah I thought it was really nice too uh <laughs> What did you think? Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I thought the opening was pretty funny too. When he's going all around revealing all this shit, and uh, he talks about the boxer's trainer having an affair oh, yes. with his girlfriend. <laughs> Cut to the door opening, and you see this huge burly guy with a scar on his face. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, <laughs> that might be what I draw actually. Yeah, and they again they make reference to Paxton Powers. That this was the one where they say Paxton Powers. Remember that guy? So I don't, I don't know if he's now just a throwaway joke or if this is a setup to use him again and just remind people who it is. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh, maybe they're gearing up to use him again in another episode. Um, yeah. But I don't know if, if the show thinks that far ahead. Like, that would be pretty yeah. impressive if they were like, all right, we want to have Paxton in season three, but we haven't heard from him for a while. So let's pepper him in season two just so we can get people ready. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I probably wouldn't think that if it hadn't been for the fact that two episodes in a row kind of name drop him hmm. in a referential way but yeah you know either way it wouldn't surprise me if if he doesn't come back for the rest of the season wouldn't surprise me if he shows it up again in three episodes it wouldn't surprise me yeah what would you draw on this one what would i draw i would draw i the the fight at the end where he's like half phasing through stuff while they're fighting was yeah. really cool. I think I would yeah. want to draw that. That was very neat. I, w I kept thinking about how that would be a great scene in a movie as well to have mm. this guy fa half halfway falling through stuff while he's trying to have a, a fight with Batman. That would be very cool. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool too. I thought he was going to solidify or half solidify in the floor. So he could die because suddenly his organs would be fused with carpet. Oh, right. Yes. Which reminds me of a TNG episode where I think it was called phase or people got phased and people would reform while they're like floating through the bulkhead. Yes. I remember that one. Yeah. Really and some scary people, moment. some people end up stuck in rocks and stuff, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or this one woman is just like her torso is just sticking out of the floor in the hallway. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, it was no definitely thanks. one of the darker moments of TNG that it was. It didn't, I don't think it realized how dark it was. Yeah, because <laughs> you know this is old Star Trek, so all the lights are turned on. You can see everything. Right. Yes. You know, speaking of dark, what did you think about that sequence where he's falling through all the different floors? Because that was pretty. That was pretty freaky. Yeah, Batman's trying to follow him and yeah. go from floor to floor down this the staircase. That and, would be. Uh, how would you draw that? That would be a that would be tough to draw in a comic. Yeah, that's a good point. You, I'm tempted to do a full page where you draw like a cross section of a building and have him uh, falling through each each building. Each yeah. floor would be like a different panel, and you would uh, use word balloons to like lead the reader through each panel as it goes down the page. And then at the very, you'd have Batman like the go the image of Batman would appear in each panel going down, trying to catch this guy. But yeah, yeah, that might be something really interesting where a, a comic book could do something with that that a cartoon couldn't. Yeah. What if you did like you did like a, a, a full page splash sort of, mm -hmm. but you, you did it as like like the whole page. You, it's still broken up into panels, but each panel is a continuing three point perspective shot going down through mm -hmm. through the building. So, like, imagine you cut the front of the building off so you can see into each room. So, basically, what you're um, creating is the illusion of, as it gets closer to the vanishing point, he's getting smaller and smaller as he's falling through the floors. Oh, I see. Something like that. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. That might be kind of cool. Yeah. Or if you've reversed it and you were looking up at the building, but it was, was cross-section. Yep. That could work, too. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And I'm, yeah, it would be fun to do the the last. After he falls through the the, the basement, he's basically in rubble and you know bedrock basically. Yes, yeah. So you would just draw. You could just cut to black basically and have his last scream on a, a full splash of just blackness or something. You know. Yeah. Or as it as it like the the font gets smaller and smaller. 
Yeah, you could do like a so you do that full page three point perspective, then do like a a, a page turn into a double yeah. page spread of him sticking out from the bedrock with Batman there looking on with like in horror, and yeah. then do some panels at the bottom of his face like sinking yeah. into the floor. That'd be pretty rad. Do you think Bruce's reaction was the right reaction at the end? Ooh, he just sort of shrugs question. it off and goes, "Yeah, he's just gonna fall the center of the earth." I imagine. Well. Yeah. Let's get out of here. You know, I'm going to say, I don't know if I would say the. It didn't seem very bad. It seemed a little bit cold and dismissive. It from is, Batman. but also he killed his friend and blew up his lab. So I kind of yeah. don't blame him. Like, I, I can yeah. understand why he would have that reaction, why you would write it that way. Yeah. But yeah, it is. It is very cold. Although, you know, he is old man. Batman is a lot colder i think than the the tas mm. batman who did have a lot of warmth to him that's a good topic to dive into at some point mm. i'm surprised we haven't talked about that yet because i think you're right yeah it makes you wonder like what is the again this is one of the problems with them never really getting into this stuff but what made him go get colder was it mm -hmm. just old age was it? Did something happen? Was it the? Yeah. Was it the death of the Joker and the? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess the return of the Joker is, happens in yeah. this universe, but are the events you know, never, of the flashback of Cat, death of the Joker? There's something with Catwoman, maybe. They never really talked about what happened with him and Catwoman. Yeah. Uh, in this, and I feel like that would have been a great episode had they done it, because you could also get these great flashbacks. Yeah. Which they don't seem to want to give you. Yeah, we've definitely brought that up before, and I, I, Catwoman is a big oversight in this yeah. show. And again, you know, it's, I, I guess you kind of have to make your decision because once you start going down that path, you could do that for Catwoman. You could do it for Nightwing. You could do it for yeah. everybody, which mm -hmm. I, I guess if, if the idea here is to move forward with Terry, I can see why they wouldn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't know. It seems like fun stories to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they I, I, you know, too. okay. So you know uh, um, what I was thinking in the scene where Bruce shows up at uh, what the hell is this guy's name? Hold on a second. Uh, his name is Ian Peak. <laughs> okay, uh, when Bruce <laughs> shows up at Peak's apartment, you know, at when you know Terry goes to find him and Bruce is gone, and they cut to him coming up the elevator. <clears throat> yeah, I found myself thinking how great this version of Bruce would have been played by Michael Keaton. Because, you know, because he has that coldness and darkness to the way that he plays Bruce a lot of the times mm -hmm. that I think that scene would have been awesome if they had done... That was the scene that made me really bummed out that they weren't doing a Batman Beyond type movie with, with him as Bruce. I feel like if this flash movie is successful they'll talk to keaton very quickly about doing a batman beyond maybe i don't know this i i mean obviously i haven't seen it i don't know yeah if it connects or deconstructs anything yeah i don't know if what's on the table for after this yeah. but it's such a it, i think it makes sense for a lot of reasons not just because i'm a fanboy but he's still somewhat youthful he can still kind of move he's not like patrick stewart old yet mm -hmm. um uh the the dc movies have been such a clusterfuck they're bringing in multiverses now so i don't know how they're setting him up in this but if they if he if keaton's in it just for like a 15 minute cameo like a glorified keaton window here mm -hmm. And then he goes back to his universe or something. Then you could easily do a story from that universe that's like a Batman Beyond type of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so you could do it's it's sort of not connected to anything, uh, and it being free and untethered is a benefit because the stuff you've tried to create is so botched down and awful yeah. that they're trying to write themselves out of it. Whereas a multiverse Michael Keaton story that's Batman Beyond is like, you can do whatever you want. It's totally unconnected. You, can, you don't even have to mention the Flash movie right. in the Batman Beyond movie if you don't want to, you know? Yeah. yeah. Why I would you? 
because it's probably going to be terrible. <laughs> if if after if after this someone comes up to him and goes, "Have you seen Logan?" and he's going to say, "No, I haven't seen Logan," and then that person <laughs> is going to explain Logan to him, and then uh-huh. say, "We want to do that, but with your Batman and a new right. Batman." Maybe he but would funnier. go for it. Yeah, but not yeah. quite as bleak. Yeah. He has to <laughs> he has to know what Batman Beyond is. There's no way he doesn't know that. Yeah, he, he, you know, honestly, it never surprises me what what yeah. these guys do and don't. Like what is uh who is it? Brent Spiner. Anytime someone asks him about an episode of the show, he's like, I don't know, I've never watched it. Which may be a bit at this point, but he seems That's just to... him being a dick though. That's just him being a, a Well, there an are asshole. people who just don't watch the stuff that they I mean, if I was on Right. Seven okay. seasons of twenty-five episode season television. I wouldn't watch half mm-hmm. that shit. But T- Keaton is probably touring and doing open audience Q and As, and he's been doing yes, open somebody, audience Q and As yeah, for decades. Someone, yeah. yeah, raised their hand and said, "Would you ever do Batman Beyond?" And he was like, "What the fuck is that?" And someone must have told him. Like it is definitely on his radar. If he is a manager. That ma- if that manager didn't mention it to him, that manager should be murdered. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the thing is. So many, I, a lot of these characters have the opportunity. I wouldn't even use Logan because I think Logan falls under this umbrella that I'm going to mention. But mm-hmm. these characters, they, they all have an, an unforgiven in them that uh-huh. n- so few of them get to do. Like when they were, right. um, when they were talking about doing a fifth Rambo, mm. my thought was, man, this should be Rambo versus some sort of domestic terrorist. Because yeah. that would be such a great closed circle on the whole mm-hmm. Rambo character. And that yeah. could be Stallone's Unforgiven, where he kind of makes yeah. his grand statement about violence and stuff. But instead, yeah. they send him to Mexico to kill a bunch of Mexicans, because <laughs> why not? <laughs> and and Logan, Logan is kind of like an Unforgiven type movie. I think there's mm-hmm. that sort of idea where you get to sort mm-hmm. of say your final piece on this character or genre. Yeah is yeah. um so not everybody gets these i think yeah. i think patrick stewart had the opportunity and i yeah. i would say they sort of did it but mm-hmm. you know i don't know but yeah but it would be if they, I had, think, if they had killed off his character at the end if they had given him a better send-off then it would be his unforgiven yeah. yeah i think that um if like if i'm pierce Brosnan right now i want to do old man james bond you just killed off Daniel Craig. Yeah. People understand multiverses now. Just put out a fucking James Bond movie where James Bond is in the sixties. That would Brosnan be. Brosnan is still yeah. generally young. Like I think he should play that card. I would ride that hardcore if I was him. That see would if be I could pretty get baller. that approved. Yeah. Because like I, I don't think Timothy Dal- Dalton could pull it off, but t- Pierce Brosnan still had Goldeneye was so loved. It doesn't matter that the other movies were were not good. Right. Pierce Brosnan was always great. I think he could do that better than any other bond could yeah the only other one to do it is connery yeah i mean he's true in it wasn't quite the same thing because that was kind of a fuck yeah. it was a fuck you to the, the people who owned yeah. the bond franchise and it was like yeah, i'm still young whatever i'm not old yeah I'm coloring my hair you didn't embrace the uh unforgiven right of it all right yeah uh yeah that would be pretty pretty rad but yeah i think there's again i don't know what this movie is has in store for Michael Keaton yeah. Batman but I I would be shocked if I came out of it going you know what they did it they nailed it <laughs> yeah yeah it's pretty it's everything is against this movie the the last 15 years of bad DC movies have to be addressed somehow in this movie and uh, what kills me is you're using the big Michael Keaton comeback as a band-aid to fix the mismanagement of the last decade that's what's so annoying. Like, if you're going to use up Keaton, use him on a Batman Beyond or something worthwhile. You don't use him as a Band-Aid for the, this all this bullshit. Well, the other thing, too, is I wonder if that wasn't ultimately what the Batgirl movie was. Because I think that was sort of the role he was supposed was playing in the Batgirl movie, was that he was the old Batman who was training this new Batgirl. Okay. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, as far as he's concerned, he already did it. And we're yeah. probably never going to see that movie, but... That's too bad. I'd love to see the footage, at least, of... I know it's uh, uh, so bad of a movie, they didn't think they could save it in post. Um, it's going to come out. It's s- going to come out eventually. This shit always comes out. Someone's going to yeah. leak it. I hope it does. Yeah. I mean, it, it can't be any worse than some of the other garbage that they've rolled out from, from the DCU, honestly. 
yeah. this point, who gives a shit? It's, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, we both did What Would You Draw, right, for this one? Yeah. Yeah. So for rating, I'll go four. Yeah. Just because I thought the ending was really strong. Yeah, I'll go four as well. It took it took a little bit to get going, but I think this is one of the more interesting episodes that they've done in a, in a bit. It maybe yeah. doesn't have as much emotional weight to it, but I think it's it's the ending is really strong, and mm-hmm. some of the stuff they're playing with is it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. So uh, uh, do you want to tell us about a bit about the Lake Como? Yeah. Comic Con. So it's it's funny <laughs> with people's accents in France and Italy. When people say Lake Homo, it kept sounding like Lake Homo to, mm, to me, yes. and I couldn't stop laughing with people. Anyway, I'm a child. <laughs> um, so yeah, I um, I got an invite to do Lake Como, which is uh, if anybody's seen one of the James Bond movies uh, where Daniel Craig is just chillaxing by this Italian lake near this mansion. That's Lake Como. It's in northern Italy. Oh, it's beautiful. It's one of like the jewels. Of, it's amazing when you see this place. Sure. I mean, we literally saw a rainbow leaving the convention hall one day. Um, you know, they flew me first class there do and they, back. Do they only have rainbows in Italy? <laughs> that uh, <laughs> I mean, it is like homo. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I shouldn't have set you up for that one. Did you set... All right, was that on purpose? It was okay. not on purpose. Because <laughs> it was pretty perfect. Because <laughs> I fucking nailed that shit. You did. And it's just, it'll be the last show that we do before someone cancels us. I mean, if there was ever an excuse for a gay joke, that was probably it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I've been uh, invited to this show for a while. It's kind of like a boutique show. Artists are dying to get in. They they only allow... You're like, uh, you're like Roger ex- Rabbit. You get the, the three knocks on the wall. You can't not finish the joke <laughs> anyway continue um so the, it's they charge a lot of money for to, to to enter so if you're an attendee it costs like 250 or 500 dollars oh, for wow. a ticket for a day or two yeah they only sell a thousand tickets they only have high-end artists a-level people like bill sankavich you know mateo scalera um a lot of big names mm. um so they invited me a few years ago but i couldn't get on airplanes i just my anxiety was out of control and it was just bad so i've been putting off this trip to europe because i just don't want to fly in over an ocean where, where there's no airport around to land a damaged plane <laughs> so uh i also had this invite to do this signing in france um my publisher there is urban comics batman sells really well over there so they've been dying to get me back and basically do a road tour so i said to them well you, they all know each other, the Italian guys and these French guys, and they're all sort of friends. So I said, can you guys just fly me over there once? I'll do France first. I'll do a signing tour, and then I'll go to Italy. I'll take a train, and then we'll do that, and then I'll just come home because uh, I don't want to be gone for too long because I really want to get back to Zorro. Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, they managed to put it together. Um, I show up. I have a, a, a girl who's my translator. She's my road manager. So I've never met her before, but she is – like attached to my hip the whole time and it was great she was she was awesome um it's funny when i were i show up at the hotel and i'm like oh so are you with me the whole time she's like yes like oh, so everywhere we go like there are no other artists or writers or creators it's just you and me and she's like yeah i'm like okay do you want to get a coffee or something and like get to know each other she's <laughs> like sure so i'm asking her questions and i'm like you know she's 27 uh she's really nice and uh, i was asking her what kind of comic she's into she says she's she's into feminist comics. Oh, and I was like, oh, is that like a genre here? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know that. So she kept talking about feminism and uh, like feminism in France is is just a different word than it is here. Um, so when, normally when a friend throws feminism at me, I'll start poking holes and just being antagonizing because I think it's fun. Um, but I don't know this girl very well. I don't want to piss her off. So you know. Uh, once I got to know her, I started to ask her more questions and it's really interesting, the difference in feminism in France versus how it is here. Mm-hmm. Um, especially because there's a whole genre of books for it there. Yeah. Uh, in case in point, you walk into a comic book shop in Europe and you see, um, everything is hardbound, uh, hardcover books, clean spines. It's just pristine. And the categories are like adventure comics pirate comics sci-fi comics feminism comics history comics like it's broken down to so many subcategories that we don't even have here it was Mm -hmm. pretty amazing um yeah so you know it was fun meeting a lot of people uh did one in paris and le mans 
in Nice, uh, a couple other places. Uh, but yeah, get up at eight, get on the train, uh, try to sleep on the train, get to town, do a quick lunch with people I don't know, sit down, sign for two to four hours, sketching, shaking hands, and trying to speak broken French with my assistant. <laughs> uh, go to a big dinner. They don't let you go to sleep. It's like, oh, here, try this wine, try this food. Here's a delicacy from that we've been saving for this occasion. Oh, like, boy. you can't say no. Yeah. And uh, one day I tried, like, I, I was hung over that morning. I'm, like, telling my assistant, please don't let me drink anymore today. I, I just can't. Like, I can feel my body beginning to crash. I still haven't acclimated to the time yet. Uh, and I'm older than I used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but then at dinner, you know, this guy, like, oh, my family owns this famous vineyard, and we've got three bottles of wine set aside. They're 20 years old, and we save them just for you. Oh, so wow. you, you can't not drink them. It right. would be rude. Right. So I'm like, okay, here we go again. So, you know, it was basically keeping up that, that rock star schedule for a week straight, um, which sounds fun in theory, and it is, but it's, it's really exhausting. Uh, so finally, I ended up, my, my wife flew out halfway through, met her in Nice, and then we took the train to uh, Italy, and it's just calm and relaxed, and I finally had a day to just do what I wanted, and just walk around and shop and all that, and it's just beautiful. Um yeah, and then the uh, the convention center itself, it looks like the building from Jurassic Park <laughs> when the, the trucks roll up to, you know, sure. spared no expense. Sure. It's like green trees hugging it, big windows, sort of futurist but rugged at the same time. Uh, it's hard to describe, man. And even the, the they put us up in this, uh, for the a big event party, it was this um, sort of converted mansion castle thing that uh, looks like a setting of a James Bond movie again. It just feels like, Man, comics doesn't deserve this kind of treatment. This is I felt guilty. Like I felt like you know, I, I think the industry's in trouble. And I think there's some serious questions we have to answer. And I'm on top. Like I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about everybody else. Mm -hmm. And to be at this big extravagant event where all these artists are celebrating, like I felt thrilled that a lot of these guys who were there feeling good and drinking and eating for free. It's nice that they're celebrated because I know they're not making the living that I am. But I also felt like it just is wrong to be at a party and patting ourselves on the back when things are so shaky right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sure. I, f I felt like... Um, Mas mask, I of, was... mask of the Red Death Syndrome. Where everybody's <laughs> behind the safe walls partying while everybody's dying outside. Sort of. Yeah, I felt like a general. And I'm in the, the palace with the king and his queen partying. Right, and right. I'm like... You know, people outside aren't happy, right? You know, this is going to blow back in your face, but okay, I'm what are they going to do? Here. Have some sort of <laughs> French revolution or something? <laughs> Get real. Yeah. Oh man. Um. So yeah, it was fun. Uh, great hotel right by the uh, lake, and uh, Kevin Eastman, who created the uh, Ninja Turtles, was at the same hotel, and he's there with his in-laws and his wife, uh, and a bunch of other people who work on his books, and so. For like four days straight, I would just run into Kevin Eastman at the bar, at breakfast, at dinner, and you just, it was crazy. Um, so one night at the bar, I was like, Kevin, you know, I, I have mutual friends. I know this guy, Steve, who used to be in your studio, and he did all the box art for your action figures. Oh, yeah. And he had this, uh, you know, you know, Steve. And then he also had this uh, shop called Shellback, which mm -hmm. is in Maine. And, you know, I'm I'm in Maine, and I know that Kevin Eastman's like a local hero because he's from Maine. And so I, I, I described my cred to him just to let him know that <laughs> we knew some, the same people and all that. And he's like, oh, what do you do when I go, oh, I do some Batman. I told him my book. He never heard of it, which is totally fine. I don't care. <laughs> and uh, as I had some more uh, drinks, I was like, Kevin, I got to ask you a question, man. You had that Acura NSX, right? Which is this uh, 90s Acura. Uh, if you've ever seen Pulp Fiction, uh, The Wolf. Uh, who drives one of these cars it's oh, like okay. a white it, it looks like a ferrari and it was a uh, honda built it and it was called the ferrari killer because this thing was amazing and it was better than a ferrari and way cheaper oh um so it's called the acura N nsx here and i know kevin had one and i go kevin i've been telling the story about you for a long time i i, I go around i teach i i you know when i depart wisdom on people i talk about you sometimes and i've been telling this story <laughs> and i hope it's true but let me tell it for you right now, and you can tell me if it's true or not. So he's like, okay. He kind of leans back in his chair a bit, and I go, I heard that after you got a bunch of money from Ninja Turtles, you went to an Acura dealership and tried to buy the new Acura NSX. 
And because you were a nerdy comic book guy, they took one look at you, decided that you couldn't afford it, and tried to sell you a Honda Civic. So you left there, annoyed, you went across town to another Acura dealership, and you bought the Acura NSX there. And in my mind, he did the Julia Roberts thing for Pretty Woman, <laughs> where he drives his car over, and he's like, big mistake, motherfuckers. You know, you know cash falling out of his pockets, mm-hmm. hookers in the back, whatever. You know, That's the scene that I, 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 in my mind. And I'm like, is that what happened? And he goes, no, I actually bought two of them. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. Okay. Yes. And he goes, yeah, when the car came out, I had to order it. So I went to one dealership and I ordered it. And they weren't sure if they could get it. So I went to the other dealership and I ordered that one. And I got a different color in case I accidentally got two. Nice. <laughs> and they both came in on the same day. Nice. <laughs> And then someone who was in his family or his studio was next to him, and he's like, yeah, I remember the red one. You had that one out west, and that's the one I used to drive around for fun. <laughs> Very good. And, uh, yeah, I loved that I told him this story that I thought was too crazy to be true, and he actually ended up impressing me with the fact that he bought not just one but two of them. I thought, amazing. I thought he was going to say, wow, most people usually ask me about the tank that I owned. Yeah. Oh, he mentioned the tank, too. Oh, he did? But okay. I, yeah. I knew about the tank. and Yeah. I skipped around that because I don't care about tanks, but I, I care about that Acura. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, a story about John Bonham from Led Zeppelin. He apparently yeah. once went wanted to buy a Rolls Royce, and so he wandered into the Rolls Royce place <laughs> looking like the drummer from Led Zeppelin. And he's like, I want to buy this car. And the guy was like, sir, you can't possibly be serious. And he's like, no, I want to test drive this car. And he goes, yeah. sir, come on. And then so he finds this one. I want to test drive it right now. And so he got into it, turned it on, drove it through the window of the dealership. <laughs> Got out and threw the guys the keys and said, spray it up, make it look great. I'll pick it up tomorrow and don't ever talk back to me again. Wow. Is that true? At, from his, his son told that story. So okay. take that with That's as many grains of salt as you want. But That's awesome, man. Even if it's not true, I, I just want to believe it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Was yeah the, uh, Kevin went, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. He mentioned the tank uh, and uh, some of the other stuff he did with his money. It's, it's pretty interesting. And, uh, yeah, nice guy, you know, kind of sticks to himself a bit, but yeah. like not arrogant at all. If you've seen um, any interview with him, he is exactly as you would imagine. He's, he's, he's really great. Yeah, my, my, I've only had a few interactions with him, but he, uh, he, <laughs> he made he the published comic, you. He did. He made the comic I, industry seem a lot easier to get into than I thought it would be because oh boy. when I walked, yeah. I brought this story I had worked on, this eight page story I had worked on in college. I brought it up to him when he owned Heavy Metal. I brought it up mm-hmm. to him at one of the early New York Comic Cons, and I showed it to him, and he just kind of looked at it, flipped through it, and he goes, "Yeah, I'll publish this." Yeah, I was like what? I told him that. <laughs> I told him that story. Oh, that's nice. And he was and he like, goes, "I remember yeah, that, fuck guy. that guy." Yeah. <laughs> no, I said, "My friend, you published his first book. I guess he came up to you at a show, and you flipped through his stuff, and this is a while back, back when you owned Heavy Metal, and you basically said, "Yeah, man, I'll publish this." And he nodded, and he goes, "Yeah, I did that with a few people." Oh, so Just, not special. You, yeah, okay. No. Then he goes, but there was this one guy that slipped through who I didn't think was very good. Yeah. <laughs> he was really tall. Yeah. <laughs> he loved wrestling. Well, <laughs> I didn't love wrestling back then, so it must have been somebody else. <laughs> how was uh, uh, how was the crowd at the show? Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, I've never. A lot of the artists who were there uh, did not do very well. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah, they had, uh, I know the owners, and they said we probably invited 30% too much. Mm, so interesting. if you only have 1,000 people attending and you have 110 artists, then you have 10 customers sure. per, yeah. yeah. So if those people aren't spending money, then you're going to have people who, creators that aren't, aren't doing that well. Right. I mean, no one wants to complain because you're in the most beautiful setting you could possibly imagine. Well, of course, yeah. Um, but I had a line, Art Adams had a line, um Mateo did um a few other people but yeah it seemed um like you're just you're supposed to sit and draw and people pay a lot of money to get in and just to sit down and chat with you while you work Mm -hmm. uh and I I hate that (laughs) (laughs) I'm not good at talking while I'm drawing Mm -hmm. and I've set up my my table at conventions purposefully I do signings not because I'm busy. <laughs> I do it to congest everyone into a line 
so I could just deal with them all at once, and I can shake hands and sign and do quick quick sketches. Yeah. And you know, five minutes each, get through the line. And I'm very good with with my readers. I I go out. I'm like, how you doing? Are you from here? Do you buy this book? Like everyone walks away happy. I, I'm very good at this. Um, but if, you know, for for two straight hours, I can give them my all. And the thing is, when you're an artist, people want to talk to you. They don't really know what to say unless they're an artist themselves. Right. But yeah. when you're a writer, you're in their head. So they want to, it's like, oh, man, why did you do this with Gordon? How do you feel about Gotham? You know, with punk rock Jesus, do you feel like this about religion? And those kinds of conversations are hard to, for me to do while I'm trying to do like sure. a nice, yeah. complete commission. So I'm fine sitting in a convention and drawing if I have headphones on and no one bothers me. But then I seem like a dick. <laughs> so normally I also have an assistant and at this show I did it. So I felt like I stepped back in time to how I used to have the convention where I'd sit down, I'd try to get work done and people would just be walking up to me and bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> and like they, they actually have chairs in front of all the tables. So they're they're They want people to feel invited and sitting down oh, and chatting you up. Yeah. While you're working. Yeah. I'm terrible at this. And I look over and Art Adams, Art Adams is fine doing this for some reason. Mateo's fucking friendly. You can't even make him frown. A bunch of other people had no problem with this, but I'm the one like struggling, like, oh my God, I'm what not was, getting commissions done. What was the, the, was there a language barrier at this point or were most people speaking English? Unfortunately, most of those people spoke English. <laughs> so <laughs> I was hoping, well, they'll be Italian or French and maybe sure, they'll leave me sure. alone. They'll be too embarrassed that they don't speak English well enough. Nope. Even if they don't speak English well enough, they're sitting down and they're going to try and you have to try to help decipher for them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there was, everyone was really nice and sweet and I knew how much they paid to get in. So I, I went out of my way to be absolutely f- fine and perfect with everybody. I think I took one break, went to the green room, which is where artists can escape. And I tried to do commissions there. Um, but then I had other artists who like my stuff bothering me. So like, <laughs> I know I'm sounding like I'm an asshole here, but like I couldn't go anywhere without being bothered. Um, there was one guy who was German who had something about him. He was able to sit down. He was like a, a lean back, relaxed type of dude. And I was able to work just fine chatting with him. Mm-hmm. I don't know what he did, what magic he had. And I'm surprised that like a German would be able to do that. Cause they're normally very uptight and a lean forward type of society. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was fantastic. And I'm like, I'm still trying to figure out now, like, why was he able to, to, sit and chat with me so easily and I could still get work done, but everyone else just, I needed to put my pencil down to pay attention. Yeah. Well, I saw some of the pieces you were doing, those folk, those color sketches are really nice. Oh, thanks man. Yeah. I I was charging, uh, like 400 Euro for a 20 minute sketch, Mm. but I pulled out color just cause I don't do color. So I had all these Sharpies going. Um, I, my, everyone tells me I undercharged, but I mean, I don't know. I don't, I made a lot of money last year. I don't really care. I'm, I was basically in uh, Italy just to have fun and sure. see what the convention was, basically. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, at, at the end, um, everyone's going up to the promoters saying, oh, can I come back next year? Can I come back? It's like, of course they want to come back. This place right. is beautiful. Yeah. It's like the, everyone who doesn't get to go, uh, it's like FOMO. They should call it Lake FOMO, actually. <laughs> actually. <laughs> now that I think I'm about sure it. someone's made that joke. Yeah. Yeah. Can't be the first. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the other one you made they, earlier, maybe not that one, but this one. Oh, I think the other one was even better. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the promoters are they they're sort of in this weird spot where they have to gatekeep because they really want to keep it exclusive. They want to make sure they have the best talent, and they don't want uh, B and C listers to come all the way to Italy and not do well and just be sitting there sure. while it's supposed. To, you know, that's just a bad look. So they're gonna cut back. So every artist that came up to them said. I can't wait. Can you please invite me back next year? And they were telling everyone, I don't know. We need to put the list together. I don't know. And the uh, promoter was com- sort of telling me all this. And I was like, hey, man, like, I'll make it easy for you. You don't bring me back next year. Like, I'm super thrilled and honored, but I'm happy to give my seat up to someone who deserves it and this and that. Um, you know, I don't like airplanes anyway. You know, Italy is beautiful, but, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm happy staying home and just drawing Zorro. Sure. And he was just like, are you kidding me? You're the only one I was going to write back. <laughs> I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, they, they set aside this convention that they've been, it's been, uh, it's been bottled for 25 years and, and they opened it just for you. So you can't refuse. Yeah. What's really f- interesting is, uh, writers in comics are seeing this show and they 
a lot of them are dying to come. Sure. But they do not allow writers to come. This is an art only show. Mm -hmm. They have big buyers and wealthy whales come and spend money and it's just about the art. And uh, the, so the Jeff Loeb uh, is friends with Art Adams uh, and his wife. They're like family, I think. Uh, I think he might be like godfather to their oh, really? kid or something. Okay. Yeah, they, they seem really close. Um, so Ch Jeff Loeb kept writing them saying like, can you please, can I please come, please come? I don't, you don't have to announce me. And he finally was like, I will pay for my own ticket. I will play my own flight. I will get my own hotel. I just want to go into the convention and sit near my friends and relax. No one has to know I'm there. And the convention was like, okay, sure, fine, no problem. So uh, Jeff Loeb came on his own dime, um, and he was like the only writer that, that got in, if you can even call it that. Sure. Um, and uh, my old art dealer, Jason, <laughs> who represents a lot of my friends, he accidentally uh, posted online, I'm going to Italy. Jeff Lowe will be there. Come by and get some oh, So all these other comic book writers got pissed and wrote in. We're like, what the fuck? How come Jeff Loeb gets to go? And I don't like writers are mad that they're not invited to the show. So the promoter went up to Jason and was like, you need to immediately get rid of that post. The rule is that no writers can come. And I think they're going to have to crack down even harder next year um, just to try to control it. No, it's almost like no writer artists next year. No, well, no, no artists. I'm oh, sorry. No writers. <laughs> like, I guess I'm the only writer that got in, technically. Sure. Um, and you won't be there, so it's problem solved. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But uh, it's, it's, it's almost like they have built this grail. Uh, it's this jewel that everyone is, like, salivating to be invited to. Um, and by limiting who gets to come, both guests and creators, and especially not allowing any writers to come, period, has made it even more desirable. Sure. So there, I don't envy the position they're in to try to gatekeep this thing to protect it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it sounds like a quite a unique opportunity. Yeah. For uh, a very limited number of people. So obviously, obviously, people are going to want to get in. That's the nature of that yeah. stuff. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, comics already has a lot of high school cafeteria bullshit politics. Like we're <laughs> yes. a very immature industry. You can imagine how an event like like homo like fomo wait <laughs> I, I was really trying to say it the correct way <laughs> sure you are you can imagine how that would trigger a lot well of people. why don't you just start start the lake winnipesaukee writers <laughs> only convention because there's no way to t well, wait 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 <laughs> winnipesaukee <laughs> oh boy well wi 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 yeah winnipesaukee there you go boom you know what dude you're right <laughs> <laughs> Leave all this in. This is all, this is all great. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. <clears throat> um, thank you guys for listening. If you've made it this far, uh, if you want to help support the show, head over to patreon.com slash the Penske file. Throw us a couple bucks. That would be lovely. Uh, Cause I won't be going to that show next year. Um, but uh, thanks for listening. We'll be back next time with egg baby, the egg baby and Zeta. So uh, mm. see you next time. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, man. We'll see you next time. <laughs>